good morning for me as well. So, um, the sermon today is from Matthew 16, verse 24 to 28. I was meant to have preached this two weeks ago. I was ill, it's been preached today. So I'd like to just remind you where we left off so that it kind of fits in place and you can get a clearer picture of what, what's going on. Um, the week before that, we had left off where uh, Jesus was telling his disciples that he would have to go to Jerusalem and suffer and be killed. And Peter stood against that and, and he rebuked Jesus. And then Jesus rebuked him and told him, you know, you get behind me, Satan. You're setting your mind on the things of man and not on the things of God. And that's where we leave off. And now Jesus is going to turn to his disciples and talk to them. And I'm saying this because it kind of plays into it. So Matthew 16, verse 24 to 28, you'll be on the screen. <clears throat> then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Alright, so, Jesus turns from Peter now and he's addressing the disciples and he's saying, you know, if you want to follow me, you need to deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. And if we look at that first part, you'll see that the next few verses start with the word for. He's explaining further why. And he pretty much says um, that if you try to save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you'll find it. So there's some very serious implications here. It's not just optional. And if we look at Peter's actions just before that, we see that Jesus, well, when he, when he said, uh, when he tried to rebuke Jesus and he was setting his mind on the things of man and not the things of God, he was going against the will of God. He was standing between Christ and the cross. And that's what happens to us when we set our minds on the things of the world. And so he's telling his disciples, you're going to end up doing this if you don't deny yourself. And pick up your cross and follow me. Now Jesus sets a standard here for being his disciple. We know we say by grace through faith, but he's, he's telling us that in order to receive that, in order to, to follow him, in order to be his, in order to put your faith in him, you need to deny yourself. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to follow. Some people think that the end goal of Christianity is once one day maybe I'll deny myself. But Jesus tells us that it's the opposite. This is the starting point. In the Gospel of Luke, where he talks about the cost of following him, he says similar words, but he says, no one builds a tower without checking the cost first. No one goes to war without checking the cost first. It's serious words. In fact, he, this, is, this is the second time he's saying this in the book of Matthew. In Matthew chapter 10, he said very similar words. So it must be important for Matthew to include it in here twice. Now, Jesus is not trying to make things difficult for us. He's not trying to set this high bar that we can never reach so that we can't, and only the elite can follow him or anything like that. He's trying to make it easier for us because he knows that if we, our minds are set on the things of the world, we're going to turn from him and we won't be able to follow him. And when, it, when it's all about what matters to me, then it's not about what matters most. And we end up doing our will instead of the will of the Father. And Jesus said it's those who do the will of the Father who are his brothers and sisters and mothers, 
right? There is family. Now, one of the biggest obstacles between you and God is yourself, ourselves, right? We were born in Adam, born in sin, that marred, twisted image of who God had actually created us to be with this self-centeredness, this selfishness, this everything about me, following the passions of our flesh and our desires, and they were leading us into death, enemies of God. And this is what it says about, the, about, about this, about the old self that we were in, in Romans 8. It says, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law, indeed it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That old self could not please God. The mindset on the flesh is hostile to God. It's an enemy of God. Now imagine you had to deliver pizzas, right? And they gave you a car that looks something like this. I hope you can see it on the screen. It was broken, it didn't start, it didn't work, and you had to deliver pizzas. So you had to put the pizzas in the car and push it everywhere you went. You would not be able to deliver those pizzas, right? No way. And that's what it's like to live in the old self. It was not capable of following Christ, of following God, of obeying his command. It could not submit to his law. And so the call to deny yourself is a call to die to that old self and live in the new self and live for God the way he has created us to be. And we'll get there. We'll get there. I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. And there's two parts here to, to Jesus' original command here. It's deny yourself. That's the first part. And then pick up your cross and follow me. Two, right? Now, if a father were to tell his child, don't fight and tidy your rooms. Okay, and then he left and he comes back and he's like, did you do what I said? And they say, I think we didn't fight. But did you tidy your rooms? They say, no, then they disobeyed. Right? It's not just doing the one part and then forgetting the other. Um, and I, I get the feeling that sometimes uh, Christianity for some people can all be all about not doing stuff. So I'm not going to fight, I'm not going to sin, I'm not going to lie, I'm not going to cheat, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to. And then their life is so filled with them trying not to do stuff that they don't have time to tidy their rooms. They don't have time to pick up their cross and follow Jesus. Because it's just this constant struggle of trying not to do stuff. And um, there's a way to make this easy, right, I believe. Uh, and then this is what Jesus is trying to do here. Um, and the first way I found for that is, is, is love, right? When you, to find something that you love more than yourself, and that's Christ, it has to be Christ. When you love Him, like we read, like we sang in the song, everything else grows strangely dim, right? It becomes easier to deny yourself when you're not focusing on killing everything and denying everything, but you're focusing on Him, on following Him. And then, that, then you look like at that guy who finds that precious pearl and who's willing to sell everything in order to attain that precious pearl. And it's the same thing. He's such a treasure that you're just, ah, oh, none of this matters anymore. The world doesn't matter anymore. Christ matters. And it's that love that allows you to push through and pursue and follow and not turn away. Love can make you go to extremes that you wouldn't normally go to. And the second thing that I found that makes it easier is that you're not supposed to kill the old self. Some people think that's their job. But the Bible says something different. The Bible says that we were crucified with Christ. In Romans 6, 
verse 6, it says, We know that the old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Right? Peter, uh, Paul, he said, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. Right? Uh, in Galatians, again, it says that those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. This is part of the finished work of the cross. Trying to do that yourself is like trying to earn your salvation. It's, 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 it's um, not trusting in what Christ has done. And how this becomes uh, effective in your life, the same way you receive forgiveness. You trust in what Christ did on the cross 2,000 years ago, and it becomes real to you today. You trust in that you were crucified with him 2,000 years ago, you put off the old self, you put on the new, and it becomes real to you today. There's a part that we play, and that's putting our faith in it, and then walking in it. Believing in it, put off the old self, put on the new, turn away from the world, renounce everything, and follow Christ. And then the Bible says that Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. The old has passed away. It's been crucified with Christ. And now you're a new creation in Christ. Let's go back to the pizza analogy. Imagine you get, that God gave you that car to deliver pizzas. A real one, not a cartoon one. <laughs> right, so... That would be much easier, right? Because it has power, because it works, because it does what it's supposed to do. And the new self that we have in Christ, God says that it's been created um, like to, to do the works that God has called us to do. We've been created new in Christ, right? And we are, it's the grace of God in us, it's the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, it, it, has, it can do stuff not in our own strength anymore, which is how the old self lived, but by the grace of God, by the power of God. And we're free. God, Jesus doesn't fix up the old car, he gives you a new one. And so at this point, it starts to not look so impossible to deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow Christ, follow Christ because God has made provision for it. But we have to make that choice. We have to make that step. He's not going to do that for us. We have to deny ourselves, pick up our cross and follow him. There's an active component that we have to do. We have to put off the old self and put on the new. We have to fix our eyes on Jesus. Right, in, in First John, Chapter 2, it says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Can't have both. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And it's not talking about the people of the world. Things of the world. Right? You read in the next verse, For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. These things, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, this is what Satan tempted Eve with, with the fruit. Um, it was pleasing to the eye, right? you know, it was good for eating, and it would make her wise, you know, knowing know things that, you know, and be like God. And it's, and it's how he tried to tempt Jesus, and it's how he tries to tempt us today. These things will draw you away from God, from the source of life. It's a distraction, and it's a deception. And so when you pick up your cross to follow Jesus, which by the way means, I've denied myself, now I'm following him wherever he goes, I'm with him, even through suffering, whatever it might be. When these things start whispering in your ear, if you haven't denied them, if you haven't put off these, the old self, and your mind is still in the world, they start whispering to you pleasures and, and comforts and, and satisfaction, and empty, deceitful desires, and then you'll drop that cross and you'll go after them. 
and Jesus will be going in one direction and you'll be going in another direction. And so Jesus says, no, you have to deny yourself if you're going to follow me. There's no other way. And so the question then becomes, what are you pursuing in your life? What are you passionate about? What do you love most? And if the answer to these questions are not Jesus, then there's a problem. You might remember this, the, uh, the rich young ruler. I won't say the whole story now, but at the end, Jesus uh, tells him, sell everything you have, give it to the poor and come follow me. He got an invitation, come follow me. Maybe he could have been the, the disciple that replaced Judas, who knows, right? But he went away sad. And Jesus says it's harder for a camel to, it's harder for a rich man to enter uh, heaven than the, uh, oh, I'm saying it wrong, I don't know. It's, yeah, all right. Camel in the eye of the needle thing, all right? It's harder for, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. There we go, I got it. Okay, I should have written it down, maybe that would have been easier. Um, right, so, uh, yeah, he didn't say, hey, come, come, it's okay, don't worry about it, come, just keep your money as well, it's all right. He doesn't say that, he lets him go away sad, because he knows that if he, he, he won't be able to follow him, it would have been a waste of time. In First Kings, we read about Elijah, prophet, and God tells him to go and find Elisha, the prophet that would be, would be replacing him. And when he goes, to cut the long story short, this is what Elisha ends up doing. And he turned from following him and took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yokes of oxen and gave it to the people and they ate. And he rose and went with Elijah and assisted him. So Elijah found him plowing with, with oxen, right? And he goes and he kills them. He feeds them to the people and then he goes and follows. He doesn't say, hey, mom, dad, can you look after my oxen for a bit? I'm going to go follow this guy, and if it doesn't work out, I'll come back. He doesn't make a plan B. He gets rid of them. He's like, there's no turning back. There's no, there's no looking back. I'm getting rid of this. This is, and it wasn't a bad thing. He didn't get rid of something bad, but he made sure that there was no turning back. He didn't want to turn back. He got rid of his old life. And is there anything in your old life that might not be pleasing to God, that might be showing a lack of faith in God, that you're holding on to? Any of us could be me included. I mean, we need to make sure, we need to, we need to examine ourselves. Pray about it. Is there anything in my life that is pleasing to God? Is there anything in my life that I'm holding on to? I need to let go of that. You can't put your hand to the plow and look back. That's denying yourself. What Elisha did. He was all in. Are we all in? And then in 2 Samuel, we see a good example of picking up your cross and following. Um, this is where David is fleeing from Absalom. All right, Absalom is his son. He's betrayed him. And David is leaving Jerusalem. And there's a guy called Ittai the Gittite. And Ittai tries to come with David. And David says, hey, hey, what are you doing? You just got here yesterday. You're a foreigner. You don't have to come follow me. Stay here with your brothers. Be blessed. And this is what Ittai says. But Ittai answered the king, As the Lord lives, and as my Lord the king lives, Wherever my lord the king shall be, whether for death or for life, there also will your servant be. He's like, I'm coming with you. It doesn't matter if you're going into the wilderness. It doesn't matter if we live or die or whatever might happen. I'm being faithful to you. I'm following you. And if he did that to an earthly king, how much more should we do it to the king of kings? Wherever you send me, Lord, wherever you go, Lord Jesus, whatever it might be. And the only way you can do that is if you've denied yourself, if you're still living for yourself. 
You're not going to be able to endure that. You're not going to be able to endure suffering. You're not going to be able to follow Christ wherever he goes. It doesn't mean you need to leave your jobs or anything like that, but it doesn't mean that he needs to be the center of everything and that he needs to be the focus of everything and that you need to be doing everything to his glory with your eyes fixed on him. In the Bible, it's everywhere. This idea of putting off the old self, putting on the new, dying, and so that you might live for God. When you're holding on to something, you can't receive, right? You need to open your hand to receive, and you need to let go of whatever it is that you're holding on to. And then Jesus says in the same passage, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? He's making it clear what the what, what what's at stake here. And really, what, what can you give? What could you receive that would be better than your soul? Like, would any of us sell our eyes for, for a million euros, 10 million euros, 50 million euros? No way. What am I going to do with, with money when I'm fine? Or what are you going to do with all this stuff that you lose your soul? And then he says, For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Now some of us might not like this, right? You, because you say, wait, hold on, I'm saved by grace through faith. Why is he saying that he's going to come and repay me according to what I've done? Is he preaching works? No, he's not preaching, not preaching works based salvation, but he is, he is explaining, look at this, it starts with the word for again, right? So he's evaluating further on what he's saying. That if we, and if we actually look um, at Paul, the Apostle Paul, who wrote in Ephesians, you've been saved by grace through faith, he says this in 2 Corinthians, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So he, he pretty much repeats what Jesus is saying here. So there must be a way that this fits together, right? How does that work? Well, I mean, Jesus is telling us that if you deny yourself and pick up my your cross and follow me, then you're going to be living to do the will of the Father. And if you're living to do the will of the Father, then you're going to do the good works that the Father wants you to do. Even greater works than these will you do because I am going to the Father. That's what Jesus said. And he said that you will know them by their fruit about his disciples. So the life of one who has denied himself, picked up his cross and is following Jesus, who has put his faith in Christ and is saved by grace through faith, will look like this. And Jesus will come back with his angels and he'll repay according to what each person has done. And the person who hasn't denied himself and hasn't, uh, and hasn't forsaken these desires of the flesh and desires of the eyes and the pride of life and these things of the world, well, they're going to live a different lifestyle. And Jesus will come back and repay them according to what they've done. It's the difference between being lukewarm and spat out of his mouth or being told, well done, good and faithful servant. Serious stakes here. Like, I don't want to come to the end of my life and think, what have I done with it? You know? Um, and even then, it wouldn't be too late to repent. But really, do you want to waste it? In 1 John chapter 3, it says, By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. So again, he's, he's repeating, right? If you belong to God, you're going to practice righteousness and you're going to love your brother. Because God's seed abides in you, you're the Holy Spirit abides in you, you're a new creation and you're living for God. And this is going to be... Uh, the fruit of that, fruit for God, fruit for life. But if, you be, if you're a child of the devil, you're not going to do these things, it says. 
Now, I'm not saying we're perfect, right? I've said this before. We're, we're born again in Christ, but it's, we're now in the process of being conformed into the image of Christ, okay? We're becoming more and more like Him, okay? But definitely, we're now living for Him. And those of us who do live for Him, we know the joy of that. We know the joy of living in His presence. We know the joy of worshiping Him. We know the joy of of abiding in Him and following Him. And, and we count all else as loss, as Paul said, right? Because of the surpassing worth of Christ Jesus, our Lord. And finally, he says, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. And that's a bit of a puzzling one, because you'll say Jesus is... There, the, the apostles passed away. Jesus hasn't come back yet. Um, now, not only in the Gospel of Matthew, but in the Gospel of Mark and Luke, right after Jesus says these things, we have an event, and it's the transfiguration of Jesus, where they see him in his glory. And it's very likely that he was referring to that. It's, you know, there might be other theories behind this, but to me, it, that's the one that makes sense. You know, it's, it's why it's placed right after this in all three Gospels, and they did see him in his glory. Uh, and, and last week, Pastor, Ju- uh, Pastor George preached on that. But again, in summary, unless we deny ourselves, pick up our cross and follow him, Jesus says, you cannot be my disciple. It's serious words, but it's, it's also a joyful thing. You're getting rid of this broken old self and you're getting a new life in Christ. Life abundant. You're getting Jesus. Eternal life. The love and the peace and the grace of God in your life. It's not a, it's not a, a difficult trade. Look at those two cars that I showed. I'm definitely trading the old one for the new one. And so let's embrace this new life in Christ and live it to the fullest for His glory because we are saved by grace through faith and we live for Him now as His children. We're already His children now. We're His. And He's coming back again one day. And He'll take us with Him. And if there's anyone here who has not done this, today is the day. Don't put it off. And if you need to speak to someone, come and speak to Ollie, come and speak to me after the service, we'll pray with you, whatever it is, we'll talk with you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you care for us so much, enough to do away with that wretched old self that couldn't follow you, so that we could be born again to a new life in you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that for your grace in our lives, and we pray, Father, that you help us to set our minds on things above and not on the things of this world, where Christ is seated at the right hand, Father. That we would put off the old self and put on the new, that we would live lives by your grace, to your glory, Lord, rejoicing in you and abiding in your love, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.